Hey everybody, uh, thank you for joining us for another Wednesday Easy Chair Chat. We're outside again, as you can see. Another beautiful day here in Mechanicsville, Virginia. And I'm in the Sermon on the Mount in the last few verses of chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, in case you want to have the text available to you. And I'm talking in that section about loving your enemies. And then Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. He spoke about that earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes section, where he said, blessed are you when you're insulted and persecuted, rejoice and be glad. So you're to rejoice and be glad, and now you're to pray for them. It's difficult to be in God's presence with hate. You can't go there. Being in God's presence, his love melts the hate. And as I pray for my enemy, my hate subsides, and we begin to love him. Listen to this uh, wise counsel from this priest who said in the last 23 years as a priest, every time someone has come to me and said, I can't forgive someone, or I can't stop resenting so-and-so, or I can't get along with this person, my answer has always been the same. Are you willing to pray for that person? Oh, yes, I'll pray for them. Well, then, I'll tell you how to pray for them, and you tell me if you're willing to pray the way I suggest. I then proceed to tell them how to pray. First of all, every day pray for the person before you pray for anyone else, saying, Oh, God, I ask that you bless blank and pour out your spirit upon him. Make him as holy and as happy as possible, even if that means he is holier and happier than I am. I have challenged people for 23 years to pray this way, and to come back to me and tell me the relationship has not been reconciled. My experience has been that if they come back and say they are still having difficulty with the relationship, then they have stopped praying. If you are willing to continue praying, then the situation will change. You can't invest priority prayer time day in and day out and not begin to experience change. Either you change because of the incompatibility of your prayer and the way you feel, or the power of your prayer changes the relationship. This can happen because you, the other person, or both of you have responded to the grace of change. I think that's good advice and good wisdom there. We pray to the Father. We're, we're loving and praying for our enemy does something amazing to you it changes you. You start looking more like God, your father. <clears throat> now, some children bear a striking resemblance to their fathers <clears throat> or to their mothers. And others don't really look so much like their parent, but their DNA matches. And I think that can be true for some of us. Some of us look more like God than others. Others look just like him. And I think if we are loving our enemy, we'll look more like our Father. The world will know we are Christians by our love. Remember reading a debate, and this happened a long time ago, between a pastor of a large church and M M Madeline Murray O'Hare, the atheist. You may remember her who got school rem prayer removed from school. In the middle of the debate, Miss O'Hare asked the pastor if he loved her. Oh, that really threw him off because he obviously didn't love her. So he hemmed and hawed around and finally said, I love your soul. Well, that wasn't very convincing to anyone who were watching this debate. And the debate went badly from that point on because this man didn't look very much like his father. I remember in California, at the church we were attending, a seven-year-old daughter of one of the assistant pastors said that I can tell the difference when my parents say I love you or I love you in the Lord. Someone wrote here, I, I love you enough to get to heaven, but once there I'll bust you in the mouth and bend your halo and stomp your wings. I love your soul, yeah, but your body and personality drive me up the wall. So do we love God? Are we just talk a good talk of Christian mumbo-jumbo. Can our enemy actually sense our love 
or tell that we're just patronizing them. Then in verse 48, the last verse in that chapter, Jesus tells us to be perfect. In chapter 5, he begins with us being poor in spirit and ends with us being perfect. And I think, what a change. Is Jesus just being wildly sentimental here? Or is he crazy? No. Perfect. Are you kidding me? He knows what he's saying. No. So we need to understand this particular Greek word that's translated into the English as perfect. When we think of perfect, we think of something in cold, austere, philosophical terms like sinless perfection. The word is teleos, and it's really a functional word. It's not sinless perfection necessarily, as God is sinless perfection, but it's more functional. It's being all you were created to be, <clears throat> attaining to what you were created for. Like a screwdriver, for instance. When it is screwing a screw in, that's, it's being perfect. It, it's functioning in its complete and proper capacity for which it was made. <clears throat> Another word for teleos is maturity. Maturity is being all you were created to be, being like God, not God, but like him, created in his image and likeness, created to love God and others. And ultimately, that's something that we can do, love God and others. There are many places in the Bible where we're told to love others and only a few places where we're told to love God. We love God when we love others. We look like God. When we love our enemies. Jesus said God sends the sunshine and rain on the good and bad alike. He's non-discriminating. His love is all-inclusive for everyone. And when we love like him who is love, not in sinless perfection way, but being perfect in what we've create, been created to be. Thomas Merton says, there is in the human will an innate tendency an inborn capacity for disinterested love. This power to love another for his own sake is one of the things that makes us like God. It is a power which transcends and escapes the inevitability of self-love. So is it possible to love your enemy? Jesus says it is, and he isn't mocking us. But we can't do it in our own strength, and that inability is what drives us to him. He never lets us ask, who should I love? But only, how can I love? So I would encourage you this week to pray for your enemy. Think of a good deed that you could do toward him. Thank you for listening. This is really going to interrelate and you know, totally unplanned. A um, couple Sundays ago, Ed spoke of the Hebrew word behind salvation having to do with space. And I think, oh, how we do need more space. Um, offer of more open doors, inlets, expansion, growth held out to us. And it is in God's kingdom. So when you have 1 Corinthians 12, 31... It's an invitation to turn into a spacious place and is actually called one of Paul's happy turns because he has just been speaking about, about zealously seeking like the most regarded gifts in the church, which obviously can lead to self-ambition. But he is transitioning. He says, and I will show you a more excellent way. It actually goes, but earnestly desired the higher gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way, still more. So the way into the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 has been wonderfully called the way most way like, way hyphen like. So kind of like, what does that mean? Well, there are, have been ways from the beginning. Deuteronomy 10, 12, Joshua 22, 5, love the Lord and walk in his ways. God has ways. We all are going to walk in some way as a means to progress. Um, the Lord went his way after speaking with Abraham. Esau went his way after eating the lentil and stew Jacob made for him. Jacob went his way and the angels followed him. Balaam arose and went and Balak went his way. David also went his way. 
It means to proceed. We need a way. If we consider Jesus is the way, we have a path we know to move out upon. And here Paul is pointing to a way that can really become the way of living life and life in him. The way, most way like, the way of love, a perfecting love, even happening while we're making our way on this earth. So Paul's letter to the, the Corinth church, Corinthian church, is definitely for bettering them earnestly desire the highest gift desire and be capable of receiving them be zealous for but in the same breath he turns us into this inlet of perfecting love an excellent way for all not just those with extraordinary gifts he presents a higher signpost than that and it is into a way an enclosure that all can walk and be fully satisfied Quote, no one shall be proud or elated on extraordinary endowments where there is a willingness to occupy the station where God has for you. Fullness of love dissolves anxious restlessness in our life. It is a bright pursuit. So Barnes spoke of this excellent way where all may excel, a way that will repress discontent and strife and ambition and rather produce order and peace and contentedness with their endowments and their lot. Paul did not denounce their, disease, their zeal as wicked. He did not attempt at once to repress it or to desire strong endowments, but he showed them an endowment which was much more valuable than all the others, accessible to all. If all possessing, possessed erasing all discontent, producing harmonious operation in all the parts of the church, as if Paul is saying, your zeal can be revealed in this excellent way. Another commentator said, it's a secret for reconciling ambitious desire with contentment. Because the Spirit gives as He wills. And that becomes reconciled with what we want. He's saying, I show you a supreme way of obtaining this all together. Don't we want to go into an inlet of satisfaction? So can I um, open up a way in this that has been so satisfying for me this way? And um, I'm just going to hold up. This is a, a rewritten prayer list. But each item on this prayer list has had its time of presentation to me as I take by the Lord himself. And has usually been through people. And it follows that I would want to pray daily because of that original presentation, just like Job knew to do for his children. So anything can become dutiful, but what happens when you go into this more excellent way into each request? You take this inlet of love and you take the opportunity, as I find in Mark 10, in this wonderful account of the rich young ruler, Jesus looking at him loved him. Jesus beholding him loved him. Quote, as a man, Jesus had a human affection for the rich young ruler, an appearance of moral good in him, loving righteousness, hating iniquity. And though the young man revealed much vanity, pride, and conceit in his claims, Jesus did not treat him roughly, but kindly and tenderly. He beheld him. He looked at, attentively upon him. He did not choose to reproach him with a lie and charge him with pride and arrogance, but he spoke friendly to him, and as far as he could, recommended him for his, commended him for his diligence in observing the commands. When I'm reading this about all that's in this beholding look, it sounds like 1 Corinthians 13 to me. And maybe a little bit about what Ed said about praying for your enemy. The way he beheld him. Same word as John the Baptist looked upon Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. Our Lord's look at Peter when he named him Cephas. When he looked upon him when the cock crow, crowed for the second time. Oh, this look. This look, we see Jesus giving this ruler could compare to Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. This is what Jesus wanted to see the rich young ruler do. And many translate, I guess these higher interpreters, this obtain mercy in Proverbs 28 as shall be loved. Jesus looked upon the rich young ruler coming to him so ambitious 
and had compassionate concern. He pitied him for his ignorance of the law and its spirituality in large and large extent, for his pride and vanity and glorying in himself. So is this a similar type of look in prayer time? To look at each person like Jesus beheld them, taking time to embrace what Jesus did. He knew this man was soon to be made sad. So how deeply and spaciously we can love in this inlet. And it may not be efficient, it may take time, but love edifies. And I think like Ed reading what the priest said, we find our true native tongue, our true satisfaction of what we were made for. And I think what Paul was meaning when he said in Romans 1, 9, God, whom I serve in my spirit. How does he serve in his spirit? Again, there's space. There's an exercise of love in that sincere, hidden away place of Paul's spirit. It's become spacious in Paul's acknowledgement because Paul has exercised it. And if you can excuse this analogy, I almost look at it as an inner gold gem with each piece of equipment potentially as a person. Paul exercised love and sincere prayer in his spirit enough that he could say in this passage in Romans 1, I call God as an oath, as my witness, that I have a sincere ministry for you. It's not nearly external. I am serving the Lord in my spirit for you. So the spaciousness of our soul to render service to that person becomes worship to the Lord. Ephesians 4 speaks of for building up the body, the body joined and held together by every joint by which is equipped. So we can become that mere brick in the building surrounded by other bricks doing their function. One thing to say about this, I, whom I serve in my spirit slash worship in my spirit is the very same word in Hebrews 12, 28 about God at offering acceptable worship with fear actually to him because he's a consuming fire. And it's like, we usually don't put this all together, but it's the same word. So I believe how I hold that person in my soul is in front of God who is in my spirit in the same way that um, yeah, Hebrews 12 and Romans 1 um, echoes. The way most way like. You know, this type of love in 1 Corinthians 13 and what it promises is also seen in John's invitation of love being perfected. Please hear this, 1 John 4, 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love, as I think Ed has been sharing and here, abides in God and God abides in him. To me, this is abide in this more excellent way, abide in this inlet. So John, like Paul, says all have access. You don't have to have this high ranking in the church. You don't have to have money. You don't have to have credentials. But he offers in these time of love perfected something at all our disposal. Keeping the word, having the spirit, love of the brothers and sisters, confession and belief that Jesus is the son of God, coming to know the love the Father has for us at all of our disposal. It's so beautiful. So you can see this appeal for still more excellence. See the offer into a spacious love that's offered to us all. Turn into the way most way like. You know, as a confirmation of speaking this, um, Ed and I on Friday heard the song called Here I Am. And it was a song done by Daniel O'Donnell, Here I Am, Lord. And then the next morning we were um, a part of listening to a funeral and this very same song. I just wanna just to share this with you. Here I am, Lord, it is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. And the first time I heard it, it's like, yes, 
This is what we're after. We want to be able to say, in my spirit, I am holding your people in my heart. I will hold your people in my heart. Behold, I will show you a more excellent way. Thank you. All right. Let's pray. Lord, may your Holy Spirit who dwells within us work your love through us today, that our love would be perfect for everyone that crosses our path or we might think of. In Jesus' name, amen.